The Metis Tech Show. Welcome to the Metis Tech Show, a show for HVAC professionals by HVAC professionals. The Metis Tech Show. So, Mike, I heard you have a Portuguese wife, and she cooks a ton of food for you. Yes, I do. Um, she's a great cook. You know, okay. she has uh, she makes the best grilled cheese you'll ever have in your entire life. Wait a minute. No, you must get a lot of Portuguese dishes, right? Uh, we've had a condensado once, um, but the. Nothing like the uh, grilled cheese. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on a minute. <laughs> Special Portuguese. Was she born here or was she born in Portugal? She was born here. Yeah. All right. Well, that might be a problem. Yeah. All right. Now, yeah. is there is there St. George cheese in the grilled cheese? That's no. That's, no. <laughs> okay. Okay. So a she's, lot of butter. So she's more like Portuguese-ish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So what All makes right. a great grilled cheese? You want to hear the thing? I'm going to tell you right now. First of all, it's mayonnaise. Really? Yes. You got to get the bread. Bread, sourdough bread works the best. You got to use mayonnaise and butter. Lots of butter. No, see, no, you take the sourdough bread and you spread mayonnaise on, on, on it and you put butter in the pan. In the pan, it's got to be a cast iron pan, right? You throw both pieces of bread with the mayonnaise side down, right? Put the cheese on there. Shredded cheese works best or soft cheese, but not just American cheese. You can use brie. You can use Gouda, Havarti. Pepper Jack. Oh, well, I love. I'm, we're gonna take a break. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know about the. Right now. I don't know about the shredded cheese. You gotta be careful with shredded cheese because no, it's got it's, all kind of like stuff in it yeah, to make it not stick. But it melts and, better. Yeah. But you know, brie works good. I mean, it's all kinds of. Like I said, the pepper jack I think is my favorite. But you know, you can also don't be afraid to add a few slices of bacon, like six or seven slices uh, of yeah. bacon, or slice a nice thick ham. Now you're talking. Not Oscar Mayer ham. I'm talking about a nice thick piece of like you know ham. Or something, but you know, uh, when I make grilled cheese, well, Mike, I'm going to take a guess here because I know somebody who's because my wife's Irish, right? Really? So, yeah. So when I met her, grilled cheese was you put two slices of Wonder Bread in the toaster, it pops up, you put an American <laughs> cheese <She's together>. slice <laughs> in there, and that's that's not what your wife does. You're not talking about that, no? No, 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 no. Oh, she instead of uses the toaster, she'll actually put it on the frying pan. Okay. She put any linguisa in there? No. Wow. No. She should, but she but yeah, she nothing does. like a Portuguese <laughs> grilled cheese. <laughs> Welcome to the Metis Tech Show, everybody. And uh, we're at the 2023 DSG conference. So there are people walking by. There's a little bit of noise behind us. But um, we have uh, Mike Lumia and Craig Johnson from Homans with us on this podcast. And uh, we also have Paul Shave, Senior Technical Training Manager, for Metis, did I say that right? No, yeah. neither one. You said them both. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. You do something here anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and myself, Steve Pimentel. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, city multi systems, city multi startups. And I always mention this in class when I'm teaching in Boston. I'm like, you know, if you got Craig and Mike on the job site helping you figure out what's wrong with that system, you got the greatest, the best people that you could have on that job. Um, just everybody from Holman's, a, you know, they're top notch. And I always say they know more about our systems than some of us at Metis. Well, let's talk, I'm honest uh, about that. Let's talk about that a little bit. So, Mike, we'll start with you. Give us a little bit about Holman's, you know, the areas you guys cover, what you guys do, a little bit about your background, and then and then we'll go to Craig and get a little bit of his background. And so. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so... I've been in the HVAC industry for about 20, more, a little more than 20 years. Uh, I was in the field, actually more than that, sorry, now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I was in the field for about 15 years. Um, got an opportunity to work with the Mitsubishi product at Holman's. Um, and I've been with Holman's now for about 13 years. Uh, back then, about 13 years ago, I could see what was happening with VRF as a whole, um, especially Mitsubishi. So... Thought it was a great opportunity. Um, took that, um, and I've been at Holman's now uh, with the tech support group um, for 13 years. Um, Holman's has grown. We've uh, originally started with you know basically New England. <clears throat> um, we have 
expanded into New York City now and New Jersey. Um, and with that expansion is growth. And we've been able to bring on 13 DSG members. Wow. Now. So, so yeah, we, we are 13 strong uh, DSG members, uh, ranging from going up on rooftops for doing startups, um, project management of the jobs, um, you know, uh, completing the job, closing it out, working yep. with any type of uh, end user issues after the fact, training, mm -hmm. um, you know, and stuff like that. Well, and, and let's say, talk about that, Mike, because um, you also have a tech support line. Yes, that's another thing. We uh, good. I'm glad you brought that up. So we we've realized as we've grown that um, the people in the field just you know they're busy and more customers, more calls. We want to take care of these people as quick as possible. So we realized we needed to bring an inside tech support uh, group of people within our tech support group. Um, so we've created this uh, text line. So it's a Holman's inside tech support uh, text line, um, which will go to everybody in our group. But mainly our inside group is ones who are going to handle that. And with that, we've also created a uh, what we call an MPD, Mitsubishi Product Division, hotline that you could call. It's a 1 800 number. Uh, it's a Holman's Inside Tech Support uh, application, sales, uh, and parts. So you'd select option three for tech support. Um, and then it would ring all the inside tech support groups. For That's me. interesting. You got a, you said a text line? We do, yeah. We, we've got this um, uh, texting app. Oh, um, that okay. We use. It's, you know, it's a platform yep. that we pay for, uh, but it's great. Uh, I didn't know if you just gave out one number and you know, it just goes to everybody at one time. That would be kind of messy, right? You'd have a whole bunch of people. But it's an app that, that yeah, so it's, you're managing it's, it with. Correct. Yeah, we, we pay for this. It's a, it's a, it's a platform we use, uh, and it's gone through the company. It started with the Mitsubishi Insight Tech Support Group um, where we could have contractors in the field be standing in front of a piece of equipment, you know, have a problem take a picture of that, take a video, whatever, and text that to uh, that's, this, this that's text. That's pretty wow. cool. That is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And let's talk about your, your training. You mentioned you do training. I know you guys do a lot of ad hoc training on site, contractor locations, but I happen to know you have, I think, at least three training centers in the works. Uh, tell us where they're going. Yeah, so uh, at first off in Meredith, New Hampshire, um, we had an open a branch uh, last summer. Um, we have a training room space that we've been working on um, internally. We've been installing the equipment ourselves, so it's, it's taking a little bit longer than I expected. But uh, <laughs> but uh, now, we should have that. Dave Perez is, is heading that, right? He so is. From what I heard. Yeah, he's got nothing else to do. It'll so be all worth it. So long. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. So Dave Carrett, um, you know, who worked uh, outside doing you know startups and stuff like that, we pulled him off the field, and he's going to man that training center. Nice. Uh, I brought in two new people to handle, you know, the New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont market. Um, but yeah, Dave will, will manage that. He's going to manage the inside tech support group as well. Um, and then, so that's the Meredith, New Hampshire branch. That'll be M and P and City Multi. Um, and then we have in Whippany, New Jersey, we have uh, an M and P only uh, training center that is live and, and running. And Robert uh, Killian is uh, kind of man in that. That, that training branch. Yep. Um, and then we have a Comac New York on Long Island branch coming up soon. Uh, looks like probably, hopefully, occupancy in November. Uh, and we're going to put a MMP and City Multi training center in there as well. And I just hired a new gentleman, uh, Mike Ginali, who's going to head up that uh, training center. All right. Excellent. Sounds good. Craig, tell us a little bit about your background, how you found yourself working for Holmans. So I started back in 97 doing sheet metal uh, installations and fabrication so I can, you know, make any fittings from square to round to whatever. Whatever you need, I'll make That's it. a dying you know? art. Oh, yeah. 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 And I miss it because that was one of the, my favorite things to do was make dark Everything's work. done with plasma machines now. So yeah. then, um, you know, I, I graduated from high school. I did that all the way up until... Uh, you know, senior year in high school through co-op and everything. And then I started with the company. Uh, I was a year out of high school. Then I got into the service side of things, um, started on installation, which is where you learn the majority of, you know, how the equipment works. And, and then they, you know, saw that I really caught on to that. So they put me in a truck. You know, I worked with a guy for maybe six months. 
uh, riding around doing service calls yep. and then in a truck and it's been service ever since. In 2015, I was hired by Holmans. Yeah, I think it was 15. Yeah, 15. And it's been, you know, Mitsubishi ever since. So, All right. So you guys do a lot of startups, right? You assist Not contractors. Not me so much. Not anymore. you so much anymore, but you did. You've got your share. <laughs> I've had my share. You probably forgot more than you know. Correct. Right? So we're going to talk about startups, right? Because you guys have been, Mike, in your case, you've been out there, but I bet you still remember a lot. I was just kidding about the forgetting. So let's talk about it because... We call. I think it's more of a startup assistance. The contractor has to be there. You don't just show up. Okay, contractor, take a day off, go to another site. They still got to be there. So let's walk through that. Give us a general, a high level view of what you're looking for in a startup. What should be done before you get there? And so you know, we'll get more into the details later. But generally speaking, what does a startup involve? Yeah, I think I'll I'll start quickly. Uh, what we provide um, is on every city multi job for the most part, is uh, startup assistance, which includes, which is most important, is the project management side of the project. Um, once the job goes and, and, it, and the equipment ships out, we want to get in touch with the contractor as soon as possible. Who's the people who are going to be installing this? Not, you know, not so much the person who's kind of signing the papers, right? We want to get in, involved with them quickly, get to know them, exchange contact information. If we don't already know them, we know most of them, but if we don't get to know them, uh, keep the communication open, back and forth, call with any questions, meet up on the job site for you know, a pre-site, uh, pre-construction site meeting, and hopefully throughout that project, maybe meet a, one or two more times, and then, um, you know, again, keep the communication open and then get to the point of startup. Um, but we, I feel that that's the most important part of, the, of this project, uh, to make it go smooth so that everybody's happy at the end of the day. Yeah. I think so, I'll let Craig kind of take yeah. it from there. Craig, before you go in a startup, before you, sh you show up, do you have the contractor, you require them to do certain things before you show up? Yeah, so we want them to completely address the system, obviously, because we're not going to be running around up and down ladders, you know, change. It, it depends. Sometimes, you know, if it's only a couple units and they didn't address it, we'll go help them out, show them how to do it if it's something that they're, they're not familiar with. but. Yeah. We want the system ready to run, you know. Typically, we tell them to leave TB3 off, but I've gone to the point of just telling them to leave it on and just make sure the unit flags out, you know, so that we know that we got active calm. Um, and then once we're on site, you know, the first thing we do is we leave the central control, it's powered off, and we'll walk around. If there's multiple systems, clip onto each system, make sure you're picking up the right addresses because if you do it with the central live, you're going to get everything. So we want to make sure that you have... You know, address 51's going to 1 through 10, and then 61's going to 11 through 20, or whatever the addressing structure is for that particular job. Right. Um, but there's actually a new nice little feature with the engine equipment where you can just walk up on SW4, 4.1 and 4.2, depending on what you flip. Yeah. It gives you all the indoor units, the branch box that's connected. So you don't even have to hook up maintenance tool. It's nice. You just walk up, flip that dip switch. It shows you all the addresses. Right. You can yeah. see if stuff's wrong, you know. Things like that, it's come a long way from, you know, the Cajun equipment was nice. You get a lot of information out of it. But that stuff is invaluable. You yeah, know? so when you show up, the panels are off, so you can just go up and just flip some switches and not have to hook up Eminet and all that uh, maintenance tool. So that's really cool. Because the, the more that you have to change and the more you have to keep cycling power, you get to keep going through initial mode, it, it can take a long time to really get through a startup if there's problems. You right, know? Yeah. So do you need the contractor to give you the DSB as built before you go? Yes. So the DSB is the most important part, and we want as built piping before they even start piping. So we want them to have pretty accurate measurements up front because, especially with Y series, you can increase piping size if you go over that 131 foot rule from the first T. And, you know, we sell a lot of um, larger R2 systems that have main and sub BCs. And then, you know, you can have, if they start moving around units, capacity of more capacity in the branch box that can upsize the the sub bc piping so we really that's one of the things we do at first too before we check the addresses we go around and look at all the piping make sure it's sized properly twinning you know indoor piping mains everything pretty much yep. from and how long does it tip let's take a let's take a Let's take a single system yeah I have a single system with you know 30 35 indoor heads right how much time do you allow for a startup? We probably put maybe, for a system like that, probably three days of startup. Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and that's not just for us. That covers, 
you know, uh, sales guys that have to go out on a job. You know, we, we, we put in enough time for the whole team to go out and do what they have to do within that project to make sure that it's getting done right. And part of that's probably because we're in the Northeast. You probably have to have them energize the system for 12 hours right? prior. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the big things because that, you know, especially when it's getting colder out yeah. and you got to have that crankcase heat to make sure that you don't have any oil, uh, refrigerant in that compressor and that oil is nice and warm. So yeah, that's yeah. a big thing. That helps. All right. And so I know you both of you happen to have a lot of these startups under your belt. So let's talk about some of the things that you've seen, the more common things that you've seen where, where contractors uh, have, have uh, the common faults, I, I, I guess, that you see. So how, what can we tell our audience, our contractors out there, what can we tell them to prevent them from not being ready for a startup, the things that are going to delay it? What, what, do you, what are you guys seeing out there? So I would have to say that the Diamond System Builder is the first thing that you should make sure you have before you start any installation. Yeah. Um, you should review that diamond system builder, look at the equipment you have, um, make sure that the equipment that you, do, that you do have is the accurate equipment. You know, there are instances where some distributors may ship a wrong piece of equipment. Home yeah. doesn't, but... Um, Especially outdoor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> outdoor unit, wrong voltage or something yeah, like that. Yeah, uh, yeah you know, stuff yeah. like that. Uh, we, we, you know, we, you see that more and more, you know. Um, and these are the little things that can be, you know, nipped in the bud early uh, right. in a project where it doesn't turn into a headache, you know. So that's my big thing. I, I, I always see say that, you know, you should make sure that, that DSB is accurate. Uh, look at the equipment you have on site. Make sure it's the sub-BC that you're working with and not the main BC and putting the sub-BC in the main BC spot, you know, different model numbers. Yeah. Or single uh, versus main. Or single versus main. It's very important to look at that. Um, I, I, pipe lengths are very critical. Uh, well, that's a lot of a lot of the issues that we see is is people aren't kind of getting the pipe lengths uh, accurately at the beginning. They they run yep. the piping and next thing you know we're upsizing piping, and they got to pull that pipe out. Mm -hmm. um, so very important for that. And then the biggest problem we see, uh, I'd probably say, is wiring and addressing. You know right. that's always been. You talk about high voltage wiring or M net wiring. M net wiring. M net wiring. Yeah. So, well, I guess. Sometimes live voltage, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. Uh, from a you know control wiring, um, you know, as, as easy as it sounds, it can be you know monotonous depending on what you have. Um, so, have you ever seen anything uh, other than sixteen two stranded shielded wire? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, you know, I will say this: you know, thirteen years. You know, we've been I've been doing this at least for thirteen years on this side of the fence. Um, it's gotten a lot better. Yeah, people, you know, people are starting to get their hands on it a little more. Right? And training helps. And training, yeah. yeah, training's been great, you know. Um, so we're seeing it less and less that people are running the 18 gauge instead of it should be, you know, 16 two stranded shielded. Right. right. Um, so we're seeing that less and less, but it's just determinations and the, in the, you know, the way that the daisy chain is run, the T taps, stuff like that. Uh, but addressing is is probably. Uh, one of the biggest things. Yeah, and that's right. that. If you, that you know, when I teach city multi class, I tell them, look, you need to understand the wiring and addressing uh, out of anything in this course. You need to understand that as far as the installation side, that's going to make or break your installation at that point. Yeah, but I think that just echoes what one of you guys said a few minutes ago that DSB is important, huge. Because yeah. if I get the DSB and I let the DSB auto address it for me, at the very least, all those addresses are there. I just have to follow that. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm done. So how often do you see a job where they have no DSB whatsoever? Does that happen a lot? Usually they, they reach out to us if they don't have like piping and wiring diagrams. Most of them. Some of them don't. Some of them will take it upon themselves. But when they do reach out to us, the first thing we do is we go find the DSB. You know, we'll make sure it's complete. Um, and obviously the more information that's in there, the better. Yeah. Um, and we try to tell them, you know, to stick to that CAD especially if it has room names on it, because that's what we're going to use to set up our central controller. So, right. But. right. And I like what, what you said about um, having the as built ahead of time, because mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a DSB that they plan to go start and all the line lengths are zeros, mm -hmm. right? And you can't, that's no place to start. You need to know ahead of time because DSB will tell you if you're going too long, wrong pipe size, everything. So that's important. So for those of you listening, if you're sleeping through the whole show, wake up for this part. We need a DSB <laughs> as built accurate. Now you can go back to sleep. 
<laughs> yeah. Most important part. Except unless you're driving, don't be sleeping. All right. So let, let's say you walk up to a system. It's been powered for 12 hours, and you 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 uh, fire off the system. You know, give it a command, whatever. What what is the most common startup fault that you're seeing out in the field, as far as an error, a four digit error code? Uh, seventy one hundred two. All right, <laughs> seventy one hundred two. <laughs> seventy one hundred seven <laughs> is another one when they don't yeah. address the ports. They might get all the yeah. addressing physically right, but porting they left the all zeros. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, duplicate ports. Yep. something yeah. like that. Yeah. All right, sixty six hundred. Sixty six hundred. Okay, for the ports, right? Uh, that's duplicate Dupli- address. Duplicate, duplicate address. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, outdoor units with the same address would cause duplicate sixty yeah. six hundred. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So seventy 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 one hundred two is capacity, right? So it's multiple causes. It doesn't mean that you're under over capacity all the time. It could be because the M net wire was cut, right? You're not seeing all the units. Seeing all the end of units. TB three, yeah. TB seven crossed. So it's interesting. I, I almost. Could bet you were going to say 7102. Yeah. They right. forgot the branch box. Sometimes if they didn't wire the branch box on an R2, oh, they wired yeah, all the yeah. indoors, 7102. Right. You know? yeah. it, it happens. Uh, 7102 is the most. Uh, then I think it follows with the porting. Uh, 7107. 7107, with, when, especially when you have a sub-BC. Uh, well, actually, pretty much only when you have a sub-BC. 4114, when you have cassettes and they forget to take out the packing material and the fan. You, know, ah, you get the fan wow, errors a lot. Yep. Yeah, no, no, that yep. is interesting. Yeah, they tape the fan blade so they don't move. Yeah. So if they don't drop the filter cage oh, and wow. they don't pull the tape yeah. off, you'll get a 4114. That must so happen a lot. It happens a lot, yeah. yeah. So to the point that I remember it off the top of my head constantly, yeah. yeah. How yeah. often do you see the uh, ducted unit, a concealed ducted unit upside down? Uh, 2502? <laughs> many times. <laughs> many times. And it's once it's there and it's piped in and the refrigerant's in the system, and if, you know... What, what can you do at that point? You can't run the system, you know? Right. So, But it is interesting on that. Um, even if they put it in right, um, a lot of times we'll see a 2502 because, you know, you're going up to that indoor unit to sense from the thermostat location. So you're going to switch SW1-1 on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and you might hit, you know. 3-1, uh, I think. 3-1. Actually, I don't think it's 3-1. 4 something. 4 something. Or one of the other dip switches by accident. It actually creates a 2502 error code. Yeah, so those those of you listening, a 2502 is a drain fault. So um, hanging a ducted unit upside down, the float switch automatically is tripped, you're going to get 2502. And that shuts, that will not allow you to run the whole system. Exactly. Eventually, right? yeah. And why are we doing that? Why are we not allowing this whole system to run? Because we don't want the building to flood. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to assume that all the drains are going to go into the one common drain and if we don't shut off the whole building, we might have water. So that's on the air on the side of safety. Right. That uh, that that main drain clogs up, and the bottom unit just keeps yeah overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. Yeah. And if you didn't, and if you'd shut off just the bottom unit, all the others are running. You still nothing's fixed. Correct. So that's why we do that. It doesn't make sense. And if I was to guess, um, another common one you guys have probably seen is probably a high voltage phase loss or something. Maybe you're missing a phase. Yeah, it's a 4102. 4102 Two, sometimes. Yeah. 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 Um, if, uh, the engines have the filters on, uh, fuses on the noise filter board, if one of those blow, like say somebody shorted, uh, the 208 bolt yep. circuit that operates all the, um, reversing valves and solenoids, solenoids and everything, and stuff, if they yeah. short that out, it blows a fuse on the noise filter board that you can't see and you get a 4102, you know, sometimes stuff like that. Yeah. Interesting. All right. So back to the startup, back to, you know, you've got the, the outdoor unit powered for at least 12 hours. All right, and then you fire it up. You're the first ones to fire it up. When you go to the start, has the system been running already? Sometimes certain contractors that use maintenance tool will let you know get the system going if we're like two or three weeks out. Um, if they're not going to clip on maintenance tool, I'd rather them just wait for us All right. because you know you can do a lot of damage in a couple of weeks if the system started improperly. Right. So, All right. so let's talk about that the first firing up. Let's talk about initial mode. What is initial mode? What is it doing in initial mode? And how long will it stay in initial mode? Craig, go ahead. I'll let you. So initial mode is one of those tricky ones. It'll either last for two minutes or <laughs> two hours. And what I notice is typically if they don't have the power applied for 12 hours, you have longer duration initial mode. If you have an, a problem with, say, closed ball valves or 
improperly ported units that aren't feeding refrigerant and you see it reflect in your suction pressure, that can also cause longer initialization of the equipment. So initial mode, from what I understand, is they're just fixing the compressor frequency. They might limit some of the indoor unit capacity because they don't want to run an overconnected system or they'll yeah. only open up half the ports that are calling. And if it's a twin system, you'll see one unit start, shut off. Another unit start, right. shut off. Then they both start. And then once that finally shuts down, usually you're through with initial mode. But I have seen trip Y series is tricky because you'll see them cycle through three and then this one will turn back on. And it all depends on, usually it's something to do with like piping or that right. makes it really stay in that long time. That's what I notice. You yeah. Know? Yeah. And it's also looking at uh, discharge superheat. It's looking at targets. It's mm -hmm. saying, look, I, I got to make, I got to meet these targets before I can go into ordinary mode. And that can throw a contractor for a loop. Just mm -hmm. like you said, if the, the main comes on for a few minutes, shuts down, well, they usually Automatic. think it's like a problem. Like right. they start freaking yeah. out. Yeah. But initial mode, it's going to do its own thing. It's yep. going to turn itself on and off, you know, and it's going to cycle the different units if they're twinned or even in the Y series, they're tripled. It's doing its own thing. And what what do you do? It, you just have to wait, right? Yeah, sometimes, it's logic sometimes you yeah. can manipulate certain things where you only run one unit in cooling, or if you're running cooling, switch it over to heat, and sometimes it will come out quicker. But most of the time, just let it do its thing, walk away from it. Come yep. back, it should be an ordinary buy. Usually, you don't get many of them stay in that whole two hours. There's usually right. something going on at that point that'll, if, it, if they're running that long at an initial. You so, know? If they're running, so if you're there for two hours and it's still in initial mode, you're starting to think, hmm, I better start looking around. Looking around, something's up. Yeah. Cancel my plans for the rest <laughs> of the afternoon. <laughs> and I've seen things like, uh, you know, like a sticking LEV4 or a sticking LEV9, which is you know, just flooding back to the compressor pretty much, dumping right into the accumulator right, yeah. will cause weird things and longer initialization. Yep. Yeah. And all I did was um, pop the head off, made sure the valve was fully seated closed, which it wasn't. It was like cracked open. Yeah. And it would never fully drive closed. And once I did that, it was fine. It's Came amazing right how one LEV on, on a small line will cause such a bypass to throw the whole system off. Yep. Right. And then it takes time for that. Once you repair that problem for the system to get back to normal. Yeah. It's right? going to move all that refrigerant out of the accumulator now, which yeah. can take a while. Right? Yeah. All right. So we're out of initial mode. We go into ordinary mode. Now, what are you doing at that point? So for an R2 system, now we'll start checking our ports. Um, we do port checks on every system that gets installed, whether the contractor does it on their own, we'll still go out and we'll just check their work, you know, because we don't want any issues when we leave that project. We want it seamless we don't want end user complaints we don't have to go back a thousand times you know so we really do a a very thorough job on the startup end i'd say right yeah i think the poor check is huge i got burnt my first startup ever uh before i came to home and, uh, when i was in the field i didn't do a poor check <clears throat> and i was back there because uh the port check is basically uh for anyone who's not aware um on an r2 system is the one with the branch box and you have your simultaneous heating and cooling and you get your pipes coming from your branch box, and you have to address those those um, indoor units to, to to tell the system it's pipe two port one. Let's just say, yeah. so it knows what what valves to open to send that refrigerant to. So uh, you know it's, it's it happens. Um, yeah. You're addressing a bunch of equipment. Uh, it gets to be monotonous. You're doing that usually at the end of the job, and you're probably doing all your systems at the same time. So it's a lot of numbers, you know. Um, yeah, so if it's diet. ported incorrectly, you could send refrigerant to the wrong office, right? Um, and yeah. someone loses control of that that particular space, yeah. right? And you have verifying ports using maintenance tool. Yeah, and right? most of the time, just by hovering over the outdoor unit and picking up that system tree that populates in the bottom right, you can pick up if they've ported stuff right, improperly. Right. You just see yeah. duplicates. So uh, if they have a sub in a main and they say they addressed a unit that was supposed to be on the sub but they gave it a main bc address then oh, yeah. you see like yeah. three ports on one unit and you can see some really funky stuff yeah, so you, you know right, right now out. shut it down yeah. let's fix our ports and yep. right. so basically you're making sure that the refrigerant is going through the pipes that you expect it to be going through and you're checking this basically one indoor head at a time yep Yes. Right. When you're using maintenance tool, there's different ways to do it. So you guys are, are commanding the units to turn off, or you or are you manually opening the solenoids. We manually manipulate the solenoids yeah. to go into cooling, which you know, you, if you're in cooling only, you're not supposed to be have any units in heating. So <laughs> you you don't 
try to look at anything else, you're just checking ports at that point. And yeah, then yep. we do a separate one hour recording of not touching anything in test run. Right. So that port check is just port checks. We yeah, don't so submit it, that for no, you extended don't warranty. That. Or we'll anything. talk about the extended warranty in a little bit. But so this is before you start your runtime where everything, you've checked everything, it's addressed properly, it's wired properly, the, the right ports are going to the proper indoor units and you're all set. Yep. Now you start your test mode, either in heating or cooling, depending on the time of the year. And you're going to run that for how long? 60 minutes. 60 minutes, and it's maintenance tool. You're recording that. You'll need that later Yep. for the extended warranty submittal. So what we do is um, we work with the contractor through the extended warranty process, and we let them, if we're out on the startup, we'll let them use our recordings, or some of them want to do it on their own. So um, usually at the end of the project, after we completed the startup, then we'll sit down with the contractor. We'll make sure they have all the serial numbers and everything required for that, and um, they would actually do the submission. And they would use our recordings and system info. Yeah, so. we, yeah, we, we we feel you know if we're on the site, we want to have uh, as built information on for ourselves um, for future. We want to make sure the system's running great, and we want to at the end of the day make sure the the owner, you know, it gets started up properly. But also our contractor has in, all the information, and they're prepared to. Uh, if they want to file for that extended warranty, that extended warranty, they're crazy if they if don't. They don't. A lot that. of them don't, though. Some of them that's, 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 don't do it. You know, it just blows my mind why yeah. you wouldn't do that. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it doesn't cost any more money. It's just some, submit some data within forty five days of the startup. And we need an as built. We need the one hour runtime. What else do we need? Uh, so you know, obviously, we have the prerequisites. The the job needs to be designed by a diamond designer. Right. Um, the Installing contractor has to have fulfilled their three day uh, city, city multi training. Yeah. Um, and then we need that as built DSB with serial numbers of the outdoor yeah, units. serial models and serials. And yeah, the system information and, page. And, and here's the great thing they, they, we no longer need to record the serial numbers of the indoor units, right? So in years past, it was time consuming. I mean, yeah. I will say we had to go through that DSB. You have to put all your serial numbers in there for every single product. Um, and now if those you, units are above the ceiling already, yeah, yeah. you got to put up a ladder and go and look right. for these things with a flashlight. But, you know, I always tell contractors, you want to get all this information ahead of time. But with maintenance tool now, it does it for you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and, and it's and huge. Not all the units, but a, like ducted above E4 will give you the serial. Okay. Yeah. Engines yeah. give you the serial. The branch boxes give you the serial, the new ones. So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, getting that's a, that's a nice little feature. Yeah. All right. So that, that takes care of initial mode. Uh, the startup, we talked about the DSB. Uh, we'll we'll just check the box for extended warranty. We talked about that. Anything else we need to talk about? The one thing we didn't talk about with startup, though, is just the way we look at that recording throughout the 60 minutes. You know, you don't really look at it till the end of the recording. You want that running for a good 45 minutes before you even start looking that it's making I, I, I targets. Was, yeah, and, I was going to make that point. Uh, we had a podcast a few episodes ago, and we talked with Gary Ozer, which is our instructor out of Jersey, and he, he used to do startups and he was a DSG. Yeah. And he said, it's so important to not just turn a system just on and just start looking away. at targets yeah, right yeah. away because they don't make sense right away. Yeah. Yeah. Let it run a good 20, 45 30, 40 minutes. minutes. I let it go 45 minutes yeah, before I even idea. look at it. Yeah. That's a good idea. And by then, you should be down to close to zero degree soup, between zero and 10. You should have sub cooling at your branch box if it's R2, yep. if you have it at the outdoor unit, if it's a Y series. And yep. Now, being from the Northeast, uh, how often. Are you tasked with setting up um, high heat mode? Because our systems come out of the, you know, from the factory, the high sear and everything. High heat mode isn't always active on our systems, right? Depends on the, and we're not going to get into specifics with the generation, you know, where I'm going with that. But how often do you get requests for, for high heat mode or do you just automatically turn it on? The way we look at it, and I learned this from Mike, is... Do you want to do it now while you're on site, or do you want to do it when it's zero degrees out and you have right. to go up to the roof? That makes uh, sense. You know, yeah. so we we usually enable it right on startup, yeah. because why yeah. not? You yeah. know, I I think the only time we don't is if it's a specific job where, um, you know, they're modeling this building and they they tell us that we don't want to do that. You know, we usually ask, mm -hmm. uh, but if at the end of the day everybody's looking at each other like uh, I don't know, should we do it? Should we do it? Well. That tells me that, you know, we should do it. And so. I don't do hyperheats. I never enable it for hyperheats because they're already hyperheats. They're already hyperheats. So, yeah. and that's, it, it, it's called something different. I think it's called capa capacity yeah. something. COP. 
COP for the hyperheats? Yeah. The 935? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it, that's that's something I get a questions on in class all the time. When I teach a class down here in Georgia, they don't even know what it, it exists, right? So very cool. Yeah. Um, uh, one more thing. I just want to get the one thing, uh, Craig, you mentioned earlier that um, the central controllers, if they have any of the last things to power yeah. on. Yep. So the, the central controllers is pretty important that, you know, before you even send a file to those and it starts to go out and look for that equipment, that you want that system <laughs> error free. Right. Because that's if you have a bunch of errors everywhere, that file will sit there for like 10, 15 minutes before it even finishes sending to it because it's trying to. And you're talking about, let's just tell everybody what you're talking about. You're talking about the initial settings tool. Initial settings tool. Which is yep. software that you can download from my link drive, yep. like everything else. And this enables you to just sit there on your laptop, look at the as built, and just plug in all the information and the grouping and the addressing and the names of all the rooms and everything else. And you sit there, and then you just upload, upload it, connect to the central controller, and you just send it to it. Takes a few minutes, and then the central controller is ready to go. Yeah, you can basically sit at your house and build the file. And when you get to the job, the last thing after the startup's done, just send that file to it. Make sure everything's set up, date, time, some of that stuff you have to do from the touch yeah, screen. IP and address stuff. if you have to. Yeah. Is it, if there's any yeah. scheduling that the end user is going to want, you can do that. You know, yeah, through the ICCW after yeah. everything's set yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. But again, the DSB is huge because, DSB, because yeah. if, if they don't follow the addressing with the naming yeah. of the units, now your initial settings tool oh. isn't going to be accurate. Yeah, so. I used to, when I, I haven't taught the classes in a while, but when I taught the classes, I told the guys, leave a copy of the DSB in the mechanical room. Yeah. Because if I'm the guy showing up on a service call a couple of years later, that is a huge help to tell me where everything is, especially if you use the same room names that are on the plans. Uh, you know, it's just a huge help. Work smart, not hard. Yes. Yeah. And we, we, you know, we keep a, uh, a, a server, a home and server with all of our past jobs. So we get phone calls. So in, to your point, uh, we get phone calls all the time of jobs that yeah. were five, six, seven, eight years ago asking for information. And they're Luckily, so excited when you are able to say, here you go. Yeah. And they don't have because, to. Yeah. Because it must happen. It must happen with the end user. Hey, I've switched companies. I now have a different mechanical contractor coming in here. They're going to service it. And they know nothing. Yep. They don't have any of that. So it's nice that you guys have that for them. It's like, yeah, hey, look, here's the as built. Here's the initial settings. Right. tool. Here's everything you need. That's great. Yep. That's great. Anything so. Else? Yeah, I just wanted to. So, are you guys in charge of just commercial equipment, or you're also working on M and P residential stuff? We do both. <clears throat> yeah. We do both. Yeah. Um, interesting. M um, and P probably consumed seventy percent of our time mm -hmm. for the last five years. I'd say, you know, even, even through COVID, you know. Um, yeah. And what would be the, like the most common issue that you're just like I asked TSA? What is the most common issue you get with M and P equipment? Uh, cross wiring. Yeah, you know, yeah. still the same thing. Uh, oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Communication, oh, yeah. 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 communication, yeah. cross wiring, addressing, also the same things as yeah. Yeah. the city multi. Yeah, yeah. Just a common theme, you know. Yeah. Um, we find that the cross wiring on the MXZs is a little less when um, you know you're not subbing on an electrician to do the, to pull in the wire yeah. in between. But yeah. so, Mike, you mentioned you you uh, Holman's has 13 DSGs. Right. Are those guys dedicated just to the silly multi product, or do they do the unitary stuff as well? No, just um, the Mitsubishi product division. So just Mitsubishi wow. product. Uh, we right. have actually we have fifty, and I think it just went up, so I might be wrong on this number. Fifty four dedicated employees um, to the Mitsubishi product wow. division here at Omens. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, with 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 applications um, inside um, inside sales inside. Uh, uh, engineering, um, you know, everything. Tech it's support. truly a team effort. All right. So, guys, so if I'm a contractor, I'm in New England. I'm in the five boroughs of New, of New York or New, New Jersey. I, I want to get a hold of you guys. I want to ask you something. How do I get a hold of you? We have the, the Holman's Inside Technical Support Department. Uh, it's a 1-800 number. 1-800-1800. Uh, 334-3141, extension 3, will we'll get you right to Brian. Typically, he's busy on the phone, so if he doesn't answer, just make sure you leave him a message, and he'll usually get back to you within 20, 30 minutes, depending on if, what he's doing on the, yep. on the line. Yeah, and the key thing is definitely leave a message. Uh, it will not go unheard. 
um, and somebody will get back to you. We also have uh, a text um, line, which is 978-253-4343, and you can text anything to um, uh, our inside tech support group here at Holman's um, for any questions, uh, you know, uh, PDFs, videos, whatever you want, quick, mm-hmm. quick access uh, support. Is there a website? We do, uh, www.holmans.com. Uh, All right. Um, and from there, we're going to have a pretty soon, we should have a Mitsubishi landing page where all this information will be. And in the very near future, um, we will have an event planning uh, program that we've tied to our website. So we're going to have our classes that are scheduled out for the year, and you'll be able to go on there and, uh, you know, sign up and register for uh, any one of our classes in uh, three different locations. Nice. All right. Oh. So we have a group of uh, Holman's DSGs here for the first half of this week, this DSG conference. Is there any more uh, DSGs from Holman's showing up later this week? So they are not. Um, okay. We, a couple of them stayed home. Um, mainly Somebody's going to man the ship. Someone's got to <laughs> take care of big exactly. business. Like, oh. So uh, we, we're working here, too. But um, at the end of the day, um, you know, we, we needed to have some people at home. Um, and my new hire, I, I didn't bring along because he's, you know, he's he's trying to get himself homanized, as I call it. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> good. I like that. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, thank you both. Thank you. Uh, hopefully this was informative for I everybody. I, I learned some things. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, we have like six listeners now. We're up from five. Hey, I <laughs> saw, uh, <laughs> saw a lot of people Come put on, their hands Paul. up last night <laughs> when you guys asked who listens to it, and I was impressed. There's yeah. a lot, you know, it's, it's surprising how many people never listened to a podcast before, and, uh, you know, he's got to guide them, tell them where it is, and, and it's great information. It's, it's, it's for the service tech in the truck. It's for the installing tech. Um, it, it's just great information on the way to a job site, um, on the way to work in the morning. You guys are going to start taking phone calls, though. Yeah. No, no, we don't, yeah, well, we don't do these don't live. live I know, no, we I don't know. do these live. You can stage <laughs> some phone calls, you know? You know, yeah. I think we need the editing because, um, <laughs> you know, if we had the outtakes... Yeah. yeah, we should have an episode on just our. Oh, no, we can't do that either. I say um a lot, so I gotta <laughs> take all the ums out. You know, yeah, and sometimes we just get goofy and you know forget what we're gonna say. It's the best part. Yeah, no. And then there was a we did an episode it was a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I was running it. Steve usually runs the controls here, and he showed me how to do it. And we did one. It was great. It was twenty five minutes into it, and I hit the pause button, and I deleted the whole thing. <laughs> so, so I'm not allowed to touch the buttons anymore. But the but the laughs were uh, were worth yeah. it. Yeah, it was ten minutes of laughing. All right, guys. Thanks again, guys. Uh, enjoy the rest of the classes. I uh, hope you guys uh, learned something. Thank you for your time and safe travels back. We'll and I'm sure I'll be seeing you guys around. Absolutely. I'm, yeah, I'm going to make a grilled cheese center. when I get home. Um, yeah. This weekend. What are you going to use for cheese? Gouda? Um, uh, yeah, maybe Gouda, maybe uh, um, some Colby, something. I don't no, know. Cheddar Whatever. cheese is, you know, cheddar cheese is good. American cheese is okay. I mean, it's what most people use. Uh, Monterey Jack, Pepper yeah. Jack, um, Gouda, Havarti. Havarti. Havarti is one of those that's a good, a good cheese. And Fontina. Fontina Fontina. Cheese. But listen, I know people look at me strange when I say mayonnaise, right? But I'm going to tell you, you, you put mayonnaise on one side of each slice of bread, right? The butter's in the pan. And, and this is another key. It's low heat. It's low to low medium heat, right? And you put that butter in there where the mayonnaise gets nice and crispy. Yeah, you don't want the bread to burn. No, both and pieces of bread at the melted. same time. <laughs> and, and you know, Mike, you no. Know, so you, like I said, you really missed the lottery on a Portuguese. Yeah, woman. yeah. I gotta take notes on this because so, I think this is gonna be difficult. Yeah, for no. Her to get. So she doesn't cook like a Portuguese woman. But what's her temper like? Is it a Portuguese temper? Oh yeah. Okay. If she listens to this, you're in big trouble. No, she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> She's not gonna waste her time listening. My wife was like, I'm not listening to that stupid thing. You know, just, just, no, I, no, no interest in listening to this at all. I'm sure. All right. We'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you.